Make It Right, the manufacturing podcast. Welcome to the Make It Right podcast. I'm Janet Eastman. I have been very fortunate in 2018 to have some great conversations with several incredibly knowledgeable and interesting people who work in manufacturing. So this week on the show, we're going to look back to listen to some of the highlights from lessons in leadership to consumer and industry insights. Back in July, I spoke with diaper manufacturing expert Carlos Riche, who's also the founder of the Disposable Diaper Network. He has more than 30 years in the industry, and he talked about the significant changes that have come to the industry. He also talked about where the product is going. With the worldwide disposable diaper market expected to be worth $84.7 billion U.S. in 2019, that is a lot of disposable diapers to get rid of. And I was surprised when Carlos Riche said the bamboo or biodegradable diaper is not the answer. Have a listen. Okay, there are diapers in the market today that claim that the top sheet and the core is made of bamboo, okay, which is totally false. Uh, you know, they use bamboo fibers to, um, uh, in a process, in a, in a chemical process, where they dissolve this, uh, this uh, bamboo and, and then chemically they transform it into a synthetic fiber, a man-made fiber that we call viscous. So viscous has nothing to do with the original bamboo fiber and you cannot claim that the fiber is natural, okay? Viscous is, uh, is a product that existed uh, since the 60s. So 19, the, in fact, the very first diapers uh, during the, the 1961 uh, Pampers launch, they, they, they were made uh, with, uh, with uh, viscous, okay? In, back then, it used to be called rayon, which is the trade brand, but uh, the, the commodity is, uh, is, uh, is this viscous. Now, with, with regards uh, to the Federal Trade Commission, they have made already uh, announcements about uh, that it is illegal to claim that a product made from bamboo fibers that end up in a man-made viscous fiber, you cannot longer say that it's using natural bamboo fiber. So that's one part of the equation. Now, the other one about biodegradation. I, I, I don't believe biodegradation is a solution for the environment. And I oppose, in, in fact, for quite a number of years, from people claiming that biodegradation is a great solution because, in my opinion, they don't really know what they're talking about. When you have a biodegradable diaper, okay, and it, you allow it to decompose, you end up making methane gas, which is like 22 times, 24 times, more contamination than CO2, okay? And, uh, and the problem in the United States is that landfills, very few of them have uh, methane gas recovery systems. Mm -hmm. So basically a biodegradation solution is a terrible solution for the environment. So what should be the right solution? I believe the correct solution is to uh, go into life cycle analysis and, and do what we call diaper recycling. Uh, there are, I don't know if you are aware of this, but today we have at least five com com um, competitive technologies that are proving themselves to, to find out which one is the best. And this will be for post-consumer diaper recycling. Uh, it's a fascinating topic. I am convinced that it will not take more than probably five to 10 years that we will have a definite solution, a definite technology to take care of post-consumer diapers. So that statement that diapers will be with us for the next 500 years is absolutely false. I, I will say that I don't believe uh, we're going to have the problem for more than 10 years before we have a, techni a, technologi uh, a technologic solution for the post-consumer recycling. And I guess that the, the, the company that comes up with that solution, <laughs> they're going to be doing gangbusters after that, because I think people do really want that. Well, and that is why they are competing against time. I mean, if you look at what's been happening recently, even uh, with uh, companies opening up, like Procter & Gamble just a few months ago, uh, decided to make it public what they're doing with the post-consumer recycling facility uh, in Italy with, uh, with the joint venture they have with Fatter. Uh, now, Unicharm is being very active uh, they have done that in Japan. They have a couple of projects going on where they, in fact, they, they recover the biomass from feces and urine to generate electricity. Then they use the electricity to generate ozone gas. 
And actually the, the pulp that they get from the diapers can be bleached with the same uh, you know, uh, energy that came from the diapers. Uh, now Kimberly Clark has their own uh, projects in, 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 in the South Pacific, in Australia, New Zealand. And now recently uh, SEA through SET, the spin-off SET, is already involved in a, in a joint venture program for post-consumer recycling. So this is very exciting because I, I am I'm really, I'm convinced we are going to find a solution and it's not going to take 500 years for sure. And it, and it should be cost effective too. It is going to be cost effective, yes. And uh, the, the, their facilities today are designed for something like uh, a million um, habitants, okay? So they have a facility that takes care of all of the diaper that are generated by a population of 1 million people. But they are already scaling it up to 10 million people. And, and the next stage will be to replicate this type of technology all over the world. So every country will have their own post-consumer recycling facilities. That's diaper manufacturing expert Carlos Riche, who's also the founder of the Disposable Diaper Network. He was my guest on the Make It Right podcast in July for episodes 11 and 12. It's consumer demand that's driving changes in the diaper industry, and it's also having a huge impact on the food and consumer goods industry. In the fall of 2018, I spoke with Donza Leggett, Vice President, Global Manufacturing Excellence at General Mills, about the transformational change large manufacturers are going through in order to keep their customers. You know, if you're in consumer goods or if you're in food, or big food, you, you've seen really significant changes. Some we saw uh, starting to develop about a decade ago, and some really have come in significant focus and, and really uh, thrown uh, the industry uh, in, into a significant amount of, uh, of uh, uh, real change just over the last five years. Uh, some of the things we've seen is, is consumers uh, increasingly looking for more variety. Um, and that's, that's true across uh, all geographies. Uh, and so that, that's, that's one. And we started seeing that about 10 years ago. Uh, health has also been one that has continued to be a, a significant driver, but has become more into focus over the last decade. People looking for more healthy options, um, and looking for different types of, of, uh, of healthy types of things. And the thing that we've really seen over the last five years um, that really has also been very dramatic is people's uh, want for visibility. People want to know where their food is coming from. They want to understand, is this sustainably uh, coming from sustainable sources in terms of agriculture? Um, you know, if, if it's, uh, you know, how are you treating the labor market uh, or the labor pool are you using sustainable and humane labor practices? What about uh, the treatment of animals, products that are derived from animals? Um, you know, wh where, how are you uh, interacting with the, the, the sustainability of our environment and water sources um, to the point where some people even want to be able to, to scan a QR code and be able to see the, the farm that uh, the oats are grown on that their products are coming from or how the cows are treated uh, where milk is coming that's making their yogurt or ice cream. Um, all of these things combined have really driven a significant demand all the way back in the supply chain from suppliers and their suppliers through to manufacturing, as well as even transportation, because people want to know to get my products where, where they're, they need, where they're going to be so I can buy them. You know, are, are you, you know, increasing the, the load on carbon emissions by using so many trucks and things like that? So this whole thing of convenience, health, Variety and now this visibility and sustainability, dramatic changes uh, to the way that uh, that we have done things before, uh, and that's creating an opportunity for small players to come in uh, that have a different view and really is starting to disrupt a lot of the big companies. It takes a long time to turn a big ship. So how does a company, a large company, adjust in that dramatic environment in the span of five to ten years? Yeah, and, and and if you're you know watching uh, you know a lot of the, the large company performance in, in terms of the stock market and uh, and things of that nature, especially for big food and consumer uh, goods, you see that it, it's been uh, you know most of those companies are down. These are companies that for a long time have been you know almost like viewed as annuities uh, from investors because they've been very steady growth, not big growth like tech companies, but steady, always strong balance sheets, always strong cash flow, and consistent you know, low growth, uh, but high high profit margins. And what's happened is 
these changes seem to all of a sudden have come to an apex. And it's created a situation, especially with uh, when it over the last five or six years, where there were lower interest rates and more venture capital out there, where again, smaller, more nimble players were able to come in that didn't have the same level of asset intensity and the same expectations around profit margin to make their business models work. And so what this has done is it's created an environment where small players are coming in, they're capturing market share quickly, they're disrupting, and that's forcing big companies to really now think about the difference between change and transformation. Change is where you make small incremental uh, uh, tweaks, maybe to a business model or introduction of a product that's slightly different. Transformation is really looking at the way you do things and saying, we got we to completely do things differently now. We have to change the way that we work. We have to change the way that we go to market. We have to change our culture that's been built up in some cases of close to a century or over a century. Um, so that transformation is really what's testing a lot of big companies uh, today, in particular in the, in the food space and consumer goods. It's also being exacerbated by the fact that if you if you move move away from what consumers are doing or some of the things consumers are demanding back to convenience, the rise of e-commerce with uh, with 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 what Amazon has done in, in in Asia, what Alibaba has done, where you know they're they're having significant high double digit growth rates year over year in terms of again how people interact and purchase products. That demand again is changing or forcing us to transform the way that we manufacture, the way that we do business, the way that we interact with consumers, the way that we interact with, with our customers, because uh, the customer base is moving away again from big box to, uh, to e-commerce and the way we interact with our suppliers and the demands we're putting on them. So it's all about transformation, looking at the way we used to do things and saying that's not gonna get it done, even if it worked for the last 50 years or 70 years, and saying we gotta revamp and completely look at a new way of doing things to compete with these smaller players. So it's about transformation now. And whoever can transform is going to win. Uh, whoever can't is going to go the way of Sears um, and Kmart. That's Donza Leggett, Vice President of Global Manufacturing Excellence at General Mills. He discussed the challenges and the need for transformational change to meet consumer demands when he was my guest on Episode 25 of the Make It Right podcast. Manufacturing is a difficult business that has a lot of moving parts and people that are necessary to move the goods to and from the factory floor, through the supply chain, and eventually to the consumer. When people think of manufacturing, they think of machines, but oftentimes it's the breakdowns between people that lead to problems. Getting leadership right can be the difference between success and failure for a manufacturer. Supply chain strategist Filippo Maori has extensive experience working with and leading teams around the world. He was my guest on the Make It Right podcast for episodes 21 and 22, and he talked about how being curious about the culture you're entering and understanding it can be immensely helpful and, in fact, a key to your success. The interesting thing is that uh, um, when, when you think about the supply chain and supply chain management, everybody thinks a lot about the managing assets, managing plants and uh, big industrial stuff. In fact, uh, um, managing a supply chain, 90% of the time is about managing people and, and uh, not in general people, individuals, okay? So, um, you know, maybe you have uh, 5,000 or whatever, 6,000, 10,000 people reporting uh, to you because uh, in general, this is the, the biggest team that you, that you have in an organization. But uh, um, what you have to be aware of is that, yes, you need to have very solid basics and fundamentals in terms of technical skills. But what really matters is the way you interact with people you uh, and you get... Uh, let's say into a communication uh, a mood uh, that uh, that actually breaks the barriers, the cultural barriers, and uh, uh, that's 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 the key element for success. Is when uh, when you actually uh, start entering in the people, and you and you just start to 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 make a big group of people 
act like a big team. And in order to do that, and in order to be able to to reach with the the, with the message, let's say, or the communication, a large such a large number of people, you need really to understand what are the key elements. What what really are the the language that you have to use, and uh, uh, and you need to dive a little bit and uh, uh, let's say let a little leave a little bit behind you what you are uh, uh, what what is your background and actually starting very humbly entering in uh, tippy toes into a new culture and start understanding how certain things are received and start how certain things are perceived perceived so uh, it's fundamental to for instance to understand things like the the counter pride Okay, so um, there are countries that are particularly proud of uh, uh, of their uh, uh, being a country, a united country. There are others that are particularly into, for instance, some uh, uh, religion uh, subjects. So it's very important to understand what keeps the people together in a certain culture. And when you and because this this is what really matters to the people. So you need to start. Uh, entering into this uh, into this uh, let's say platform and start communicating because starting from there uh, and you you start uh, using the same language and the same code and and then uh, and, and then you can start building so there's a huge bit of research that you have to do prior to actually moving into a new country when you go to start to work there yeah, <laughs> but it, it's not really a culture. It's, uh, research is really what you need is to be curious and to be a good listener. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, it's very important that uh, you don't you don't come with the idea of okay, I'm coming from uh, uh, another country and uh, uh, I I come here to teach you something, right? Now this is this is exactly the opposite that you should do. Is the 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 the, the perception and actually the right attitude is actually to come and have a mutual exchange. Of, uh, you know, um, a, a really a, a good exchange at the, on the same level uh, in terms of of uh, you know giving and receiving uh, information and uh, also suggestion on the uh, on the culture. It's um, to me, it's key uh, for a leader in general to create uh, uh, an environment where people can openly speak and openly tell you when you are wrong. Okay. So in order to do this, you need to to be very humble at the beginning, right? And try to control a lot what you say, what the way you uh, actually present yourself. Okay. Coming from you know your dress code. <laughs> all the way up to the kind of language that you use and uh, and try to put yourself in uh, in, an, uh, in a mode that actually makes you compatible with it, with the with the environment you're operating in in order to be able to be some uh, and when it comes of giving suggestion to be accessible okay there's nothing worse than taking a wrong decision and not having anybody in a team that dares to tell you that you're wrong it's it's what what saves you <laughs> if somebody tells you no you're doing a very wrong thing that's supply chain strategist Filippo Maori he was my guest on the Make It Right podcast for episodes 21 and 22, and he talked about how to successfully work in a new country or culture and the impact of automation on the competitiveness of emerging markets. This year, we talked a lot about getting leadership right. And in fact, the Make It Right podcast started with Kevin Snook and his book, Make It Right, Five Steps to Align Your Manufacturing Business from the Front Line to the Bottom Line. Kevin is an entrepreneur, founder, and a consultant to hundreds of manufacturing companies across more than 25 countries. Over the years, he's developed the Align process to help manufacturing leaders achieve success with their businesses. He shared his insights several times during the year on the Make It Right podcast, including a two-part discussion about the importance of the factory tour for both the leader and the team.
I think the factory tour is really about getting in touch with what's happening in the factory and specifically knowing what I'm looking for, who I'm talking to, and what type of issues they are seeing. The, the role of a leader in a business is to help and support the frontline employees to do the best job that they can. And so the, the factory tour, in a way, gives a CEO or a senior executive a chance to jump a few levels of the organization and get down to the touch point and show people what's important to them and ask them, what help can I give for you? What is it that you've been trying to do that you haven't been successful in getting done? And then you know, the CEO or the executive can take that away with them and start to take real action that helps the majority of people in the business. So the the CEO who's doing this right, they're coming in, they're dressed appropriately, they're walking through, and they're talking to the individuals that are on the factory floor. They're actually engaging with those individuals. Yeah, absolutely. And we don't want it to be a dog and pony show. You know, we don't want too many boards and signs and things up where people are talking through. It's, it's, it's good that we have factory floor workers ready to talk to executives. But the, the key uh, discussion, in, in my opinion, ought to be the executive saying, you know, basically acknowledging who you are, thanking you for being a part of the business, asking what types of things you're working on at the moment, and then what help and support do you need from me? Assuming that, uh, assuming that that conversation goes on with the frontline employees, I think the executive ought to be really just doing a great job of listening. The average worker that's, that's in these places, even like as a worker myself, I don't expect that the CEO is going to want to speak to me and know my opinion. So if they came up to me and asked me a question, I'd be like, I can't tell you what the real issues are here. Like, whoa. But yeah. you would encourage them to say, yeah, you have to tell them what the real issues are because otherwise he doesn't know and we can't fix it. Exactly. And now this comes back to the more uh, transparent or open culture that we want to be able to build in, in businesses. Um, but a big part of that is, is each layer of the organization having trust in the others. Um, now that's a cultural change, right? That takes some time to shift, uh, especially if it's a culture that's been previously built on fear or some kind of mistrust. Um, but uh, if you put the right steps in place, then you can gradually change that to be a much more open culture. And I think the CEO and the senior executives can really help with that. If they're insisting on trying to get you know, the real answers from the frontline employees, really trying to understand the challenges that they're having, and if they have a bit of technical knowledge, you know, and this may even be prompted by somebody at the factory or somebody in a support department who helps them ask you know, the right questions, how it helps them look around the factory and see where issues are and, and things that they could actually ask about. Uh, in that way, you're showing that it's okay to have problems in the factory. It's okay to have areas that are not working well. And I do want to know about it because the more I know about it, the more I can help you get them fixed. So how do you know at the end of the day if the tour has been a success? Well, I, I think you ought to walk away with a to-do list um, of areas where you need to have more discussions or you need to be putting some, some help and support in place. As I said, the role of the leader is to know how and where they can best help and support the frontline employees or the, or the manufacturing employees. And um, during those discussions, during the discussions, whether it's in the meeting room or on the factory floor, you want to have a, a list of things that you're going to go back and, and help them get fixed. And by help and support, it doesn't necessarily mean money, you know, although some of these things will cost some money or will cost the company some money. Um, what it does mean is that you've, you've listened openly and you'll know whether they need some new tools, some training, some, some kind of new equipment in the business, you know, whether they need a consultant to come in and help them with something or you know, whatever it is, you've listened openly enough to be able to come away with some things that you want to help them solve. And should there also be um, 
sort of an impact with the people within the factory? Should there be some sort of measure of success? Maybe they feel a little bit more confident in their role or they feel confident that, yes, stuff is actually going to change. Yeah, now that's a difficult one to measure. But what I've found does happen is, and certainly as a consultant to some of these companies, you know, sometimes as a consultant, you get started off being treated as, uh, as a senior person or a senior executive. Um, and when you first go in, people are a little bit guarded and then they start to open up. What I've always seen as a very good metric from the plant is that if you start to go into the factory and people are coming to you, they're coming to you to talk to you and to, to take you over to their equipment and to get you involved and to show you things rather than you having to prompt it, then you know you're doing a pretty good job of, of factory tours. That's Kevin Snook, manufacturing consultant and author of Make It Right, Five Steps to Align Your Manufacturing Business from the Front Line to the Bottom Line. He was my guest several times this year on the podcast, sharing his insights and experience from more than 30 years in manufacturing. Together, we started the Make It Right podcast in May as a companion piece for Kevin's book to expand on the Align process, and Kevin led us through it chapter by chapter in episodes one to eight of the podcast. Thanks to the engagement of our guests and our listeners, we have managed to continue to provide a podcast each week ever since. We thank you very much for your support, and we hope you'll continue to listen in 2019.